Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. It says, when I was a child, I spoke and I thought and I reasoned as a child, which we all did, right? And that's a good place to say some of you adults, you're expecting too much out of your kids right now. They haven't had the life experiences you have. You expect them to know what you know, and you're like, how come you're so dumb? Well, they just ain't got there yet, right? So have some mercy. Maybe somebody in the church that hadn't been saved as long as you, maybe you could have some mercy on them. They're still thinking like a child. They're reasoning like a child. Uh, we're at all different stages in here, right? Is there anybody arrived? <laughs> Not me. So we're growing up. Say growing up. <laughs> and that's not a bad thing because it says, I used to think and reason as a child, but when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now, where's that scripture found? It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. What is that known as? We call it the love chapter. Because the whole thing's talking about love is, love does. This is what love looks like. So when you get to this point, it's saying we need to grow up in love. If you walk in love, if you're, and who is love, by the way? God is love. And so when we walk with God at any given time, we're, we're growing up in love. And we begin to mature. If you're still the same as you were when you first got saved 30 years ago and sitting on that, that purple pew and you're still reasoning like a child, I'm not saying this in a harsh way. Grow up. <laughs> I don't mean that in a bad way. I really don't. I just want to encourage all of us. And if you're sitting there and, hey, you've taken off and, you, and you're doing everything that you know that God wants you to do, keep growing up. Keep growing up. This message is for everybody. Uh, when I was 19, I'd like to say I was a young man, but I, was, <laughs> I hadn't grown up yet. I was still just a boy, you know, a tall boy. <laughs> and uh, I remember it was in the early 80s, and my papa, uh, my grandpa, he bought a, one of those aluminum, not aluminum, he, uh, fiberglass bass boats. And back then, that was the new thing. You know, they didn't make boats out of fiberglass back then. It had a, like a 35-horsepower Johnson on it. That was unheard of horsepower back then, you know. And uh, we were all excited, but Papa took that. He was old-fashioned. He took that boat fishing once or twice, and he couldn't stand it. He's like, give me my John boat back. You know, he didn't. He used some fancy Italian cuss words on that thing that I've never even heard before. I don't know what they meant, but he didn't like it. He called it newfangled. And he was ready to sell it. And me and my little brother, who's six years younger, uh, Heath, I guess he was, what, 13, if my math is correct, uh, we decided, hey, this is our opportunity. Let's get Papa to give us the boat. And so we started begging, please, Papa. We just followed him around the barn. Please, Papa, let us have it. You don't want it, you know. And we just pestered him for days. Now, he wasn't going to give us the boat, but so finally we settled in and said, could we at least take the boat? And he said, under one condition, y'all leave immediately. <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he was tired of hearing us beg. But then he looked around, and see, at the time, I was driving a 1977 Datsun B210, and it was ugly, putrid green color. And he says, uh, but you, your car doesn't have a, a trailer hitch there, boy. What you going to do? And I'm like, <laughs> It was already like the chick magnet. That's what I needed now, a trailer hitch, you know. But uh, And I said, I don't know, Papa. So he reached in his pocket, and he threw us the keys to his F-150. And, and I could see his big old Italian eyebrows furring like he knew that was a mistake the moment he threw those keys. <laughs> but we got in that truck, and we drove about 20 miles to the nearest lake, you know. And we backed the boat in twice. Because first time we forgot the plug thing that... And, <laughs> We spent an hour, you know, bailing the, the new boat out, you know, the carpet's all wet and everything. But we finally got on the lake, and we saw what that 35 horsepower were doing. We were zooming past every poor fisherman over there trying to stay out of our wake when they were fishing like that, and they were yelling, screaming. Finally, I said, Heath, let's go to the Mississippi River. 
because there was an outlet that you could go to the river from the lake. It was one of those oxbow lakes. He said, yeah, everybody's screaming at us around here. I can't get no peace and quiet. <laughs> so we took off down that outlet thing, and, and sure enough, we got to the grand old mighty Mississippi, two young pups out on the Mississippi, didn't know what they were doing. And so we decided to fish this little rock inlet right where we had come out at, and he was getting the fishing rods out, and I was working with that newfangled trolling motor, couldn't even figure out how to lift it up, you know, messing with it. And then I looked at Heath, and it looked like his eyes were out on stems, like grapefruits, out on stems, like a crawfish or something. I said, what's wrong with you, boy? He was, <laughs> and he was pointing behind me, and I looked back, and I guess a big old barge had come by. And it was throwing these like four-foot swells just coming at us. We had like 15 or 20 seconds to do something. I jumped back behind the steering wheel, and I started turning this switch, and I was trying to crank it, and it wasn't cranking. And I didn't realize at the time I was twisting the choke, you know, instead of the ignition. And it was too late. That first wave hit us, just almost capsized us, and threw us all the way up into that rock bank in that brand new fiberglass boat boom up against the rocks and here comes another one and we're sticking out legs and fishing poles and trying and boom, back into that thing and after the wave subsided we puttered back all the way to the boat dock and I don't think we said a word you know and we we put it on the trailer and pulled it out and looked underneath it and that thing was mighty scratched up and I thought to myself Papa's gonna kill us I didn't, maybe he's too old to look under there. Maybe that's our only hope, you know. That was our only hope, that he's too old to bend down and see. So we decided to go, just go back home and put this episode behind us. But he, he, didn't, he got over it pretty quick because he started saying, let me drive, let me drive. He wanted to drive back home. Well, he's, he's 13 years old. We're toting a boat. You think I'm going to let him drive? Well, I'll tell you the rest of it later. It's just getting good. <laughs> but you could have said, it's time for you kids to grow up. It's time for all Papa's kids to grow up. Let's turn to Acts chapter 4, verse 30. Acts is, uh, you know, right after Jesus was resurrected in the early church. It's the history of the early church. And in chapter 4, verses 30 and 31, we see Peter praying. And this is awesome. It says, he's praying to God. He says, God, stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done in the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after this prayer, the meeting place shook <laughs> and they were all filled with the holy spirit and they began to preach the word of god with boldness Woo! <laughs> and we pray that all the time on tuesday nights lord shake this place shake us let there be revival we want to see your power we don't want to just go to church ho-hum we want to see the power of god we pray that your presence is so thick that people can't stand that they just fall out under the power and, and that, that there's the building shakes. We, if our landlord knew how much we prayed for this building to shake, he'd kick us out. <laughs> we pray for this building to shake like it did here in Acts chapter 4. Say a whole lot of shaking going on. A whole lot of shaking going on. <laughs> That's what we want, ain't it? Everybody wants the power. But it don't seem like everybody's willing to pay the price. There's a utility bill, so to speak. You got to pay the power for the price. And God's power is for God's purposes. He don't just give anybody the power just so you can get a Holy Ghost goosebump. So you can show off. The power is for God's purposes. It's to... to Bring his plan to pass. Now, I mean, sometimes he just shows off. But it's for his glory, not for ours. Amen. Amen. 
It's for preaching the word of God with boldness, like this scripture says. When the power came, they began to preach the word of God with boldness and accomplish God's ultimate mission. So do you still want to shake him? Because if you ain't will, willing to do something with the power, do you really want the power? What do you want the power for? You see, Acts, the book of Acts starts with a baby church. They don't know what they're doing. They're just a little baby church. They just started this thing. Jesus has just ascended in Acts chapter 1. And then they begin to grow up. By Acts chapter 4, they got the power. Now, let me ask you something. Can you have Acts chapter 4 if you hadn't had Acts chapter 1, 2, and 3? It's, it's part of the process is growing up in your faith. If you want Acts 4 shaking, you got to go through Acts 1, 2, and 3. So let's, let's go back and let's look and see what happened in Acts chapter 1, 2, and 3. And I'm just going to hit the main points. Acts chapter 1, Jesus has already been resurrected. He's walking around on the earth. He's seen of over 500 people at one time. He's shown himself to his disciples. And then he ascends to heaven, right there in front of the disciples. But before he left, he gave them the great commission. Now listen to that word, commission. Co-mission. I never thought of it like that until I saw it this week. A co-mission. Us working with him on a mission. Isn't that beautiful? He gave us the great co-mission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go into all the world and make disciples. In fact, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says, But you will receive power. That's what we're talking about, ain't it? The shaking? Amen. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then, what will you do with the power? You will be my witnesses. Telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You say, Pastor, I'm not going to the ends of the earth. Well, you can send your money to the missionaries, to people already over there. We got that set up for you. You can make a difference. We are making a difference all over the world right now from this little church in the back of nowhere. You can't name a region in the world where we're not already making a difference through our missions given. And that's a beautiful thing God has done here. Whew. So in Acts chapter 1, we've, they grow up and find out that we're not here by accident. We're not here just to wait until Jesus comes back. We're here on a co-mission. We have something to be doing. So then in Acts chapter 2, if you're going to be doing for something for Jesus, he's not going to leave you powerless. What happened in Acts chapter 2? The day of Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit came in, when they were all in the upper room praying, they were in one accord. They were believing God for the power. They wanted to serve God. Their heart was right, and God poured out the Holy Spirit. He said, don't leave home without him. He said, I want you to go and stay in Jerusalem until you get to power. Then, like a mighty rushing wind, the Holy Spirit came in the room and there was tongues of fire on everybody's head. They could even they could see the glory. They could see the power of the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in other tongues that they didn't even know how to. They, they speak in languages they didn't know how to say, and everybody was hearing them in their own language. All these people from these different countries that were gathered together at the feast time, they were thinking, what is going on? It gathered a huge crowd. The power of God always does. The power of God is there to open the eyes of the people. So they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 38 through 40, Peter jumps up on a hickory stump. He says, people, let me tell you what. See, when a crowd gathers, when the power of God there, the people come, and then it's time to preach. When the people come, it's time to tell them. 
And so all the people were saying, oh, they just drunk, and they was laughing at them, saying, well, this is weird. They're always going to say it's weird when the Holy, they don't understand spiritual things. The world doesn't understand spiritual things. But Jesus, I mean, Peter jumped up, and he preached a message. And what's his message? The same as it was Jesus, same as it was John the Baptist. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. What's your message today? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's not difficult, is it? That's your part of the mission. So at the, at the end of his sermon, Peter says, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. We often leave that repent part out, don't we? We don't want to make people aware of their sins. That, that would be like I'm judging them or something. No, we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. We might as well help them see if they don't know that they need to repent, then salvation would just be like an add-on to their life. And salvation is not just an add-on to your life. They need to know that they need salvation. He said, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, it's not just for a chosen few. It wasn't just for the apostles. It wasn't just for a chosen few. All you got to do is repent of your sins and be baptized and give your heart to Jesus, and you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can become part of this commission. And he says the promise is to you. To your children. <laughs> Amen. How many of you want your children to be filled with the Holy Ghost? And power. And understand their mission in this life. And to those who are far away. All who have been called. By our Lord our God. And then Peter continued preaching for a long time. Don't you just love long winded preachers? <laughs> Yeah, they're saying, that's enough, preacher. You just sit down. <laughs> he preached a long time, and he strongly urged his listeners, save yourself from this crooked generation. The problem is, is a lot of us can't save anybody from the crooked generation because we're part of it. But I tell you, there was 3,000 people came into the church that day. In one day, one power, Holy Ghost-filled message, and 3,000 people gave their heart to Jesus. They had 120 in the upper room. In one day, they're like, what are we going to do with 3,120? <laughs> Can you imagine if we had 3,000 new people all of a sudden? So what did they do? They figured it out. They figured it out. They listened to God one day at a time, just like we do. Just like we did through COVID. Just like we always do. God will give us the plan. It's his plan. We'll let him lead. How about that? The believers just became a family. They became a church. And that's another point that I want to make. God works through the church. We're better together. No lone rangers in the body of Christ. A body with one heart and one mind like they were on the day of Pentecost. Coming together. And in Acts 2, 42, it says, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Just like the things that we provide here at the Passion Church. We do Sunday services, we do life groups, we do Next Step, and we do prayer. And we're providing the same things that the early church did for us to come together in that one accord so that we can feel the shaking. We can become the power on this earth. We can be removed from this crooked generation. We can set ourselves apart for Jesus. Some of you may not want it as good as I'm preaching here. So in Acts 2, they come together as a body. And they get filled with the Holy Ghost. In Acts 3 and 4, we begin to see the believers standing up, 
and taking their place. Getting into their race, running their race, doing their calling. They're putting their fear behind them. They're living lives that begin to radically change the universe in which they live. And it was hard for them, too. Don't, I mean, just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean it was easy. I mean, they had fears. They were reluctant to tell somebody about this Jesus. It was probably a little bit more difficult for them because some of them, they'd just seen Jesus crucified. They see what happens when you start talking like that. For us, what, we might get a snub. Somebody might say a little something. But they had legitimate fear about taking their place. Jesus, up to this point, had walked with them. He had done the miracles. He had showed them the way. He had let them taste it, but, but now they're on their own. He's gone, and it's like, uh-oh, we're down here. Can I do my part? But God would say to you today, yes, you can do your part. And he would say to you, you do have a part. You do. I don't care what you're thinking about yourself or your situation. You have a part to play in the body of Christ. You're important to the body of Christ. Peter and, and John, probably the most famous two apostles, they're going to the temple to pray at the 3 o'clock prayer hour one day. And they walk by and there's this man that had been lame since birth. He's like 40-something years old. He's laying there. They just laid him there and he asked for alms. You know, he asked for handouts and for money because that's the way he, that's the way he put food on his table. You know, he had to do something. And back then, you know, there's not a lot of government-run health care plans and stuff, so I guess. I don't know. But he's there asking for money. And he sees Peter and John going in and he, he just like everybody else, he says, Alms, alms. And Peter could have, could have just, you know, I'll do it on the way out. You ever do that when, when they're ringing that bell at Christmas time in Walmart? And you, I'll get you on the way out, <laughs> you know. Or, no, I ain't got nothing right now. Or, or, here, man, here's a couple bucks. Or, But Peter thought to himself, what would Jesus do? Must have been what he thought. He said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give thee. Say that. Such as I have, I give thee. Are you willing to give what you have? You're sitting there saying, I don't have much to give. I don't know a lot of scriptures. I don't have a lot of money. We make excuses after excuses after excuses. But God would just say, such as you have, give that. You be faithful with the little, I'll give you more. But you got to be faithful where you're at. He said, I don't know no scriptures. So, learn some. I did. You got a Bible, you don't, we'll give you one. We've got the, the plan of salvation in, in, from the Bible right there on that connect desk. It's available to everybody. We'll print more. But you don't have to hit them with a bunch of scriptures. You can just do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do, and you give them what you have right now. You don't got to memorize those scriptures. When you go to lunch today, you can talk to your waiter or waitress. Or the person at the counter. You don't have to say, repent. <laughs> you can say, how you doing? Are you having a good day? It's a good day. God's been good to me. And that will open up the conversation. And then you just leave from there. Why we make this so difficult? Why? Boy, the devil's got a lot of us cowered down. He says, you're a little child and you need to stay a little child, but we're growing up. We understand we're on a co-mission with Jesus. And we're growing up. And we're not going to be cowered by the devil anymore. He says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee. Rise up and walk in the name of Jesus. And he reaches down and grabs the man 
as an act of faith, can you imagine praying and then expecting it to happen right then? And yanking the dude up. What if the dude said, <laughs> fell on his face? It could have been embarrassing. But it says, as he helped him up, his ankles and his feet were strengthened. Now, this is a miracle on many, many different levels here. Because you understand, this man had never walked. Lame since birth. You know his legs were in atrophy or whatever. There was no strength enough to hold himself up. But not only was his, his crooked legs straightened, but strength came into his ankles, his feet, must have been his legs, and he had never walked before, but it said he, he took a step of faith. And the man began to walk. He's never walked even as a baby. He didn't learn to walk. And he's walking, and then he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. He begins to leap. He begins to run into the temple and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. And everybody's saying, what the world? Hallelujah. What the world? Isn't that the guy? To, he's been there for 40 years. And they follow him out on the colonnade, and he goes, and he's hanging on to Peter. I don't know, he's telling him thank you or whatever. And the whole crowd, everybody in the temple comes out and says, what has happened here? Who did this? And Peter jumped up and said, it was me. I did it. Is that the way to get to power? God said, I'll not share my glory with any man. He said, don't look at us like we did it. It was that Jesus that you crucified. In his name, by his power, this man is walking. And he gave God all the glory. And you know what? If you'll begin to give God all the glory, it'll take all the weight off of you. There's so many reasons we don't witness. Because we've made it about us. And it's not about us. Whew. Such as I have, I give thee. They overcame their fear. They acted in faith. They gave God the glory. And all the people came to see what was happening. And then you know what he did? He shared the gospel again. The power created the crowd. And there was his opportunity to say, repent. All you who crucified Jesus. And he'll forgive you. Guess what? I don't know what they're going to do now. 2,000 more people get saved. They've got 5,120 people in a couple of days. See, what the church is missing is the power. We're doing things the hard way. One at a time. <laughs> Peter does 3,000 at a time. 2,000 tomorrow. 5,120 people in the kingdom of God in a week, I'll say. But you know what happened next? Here come the religious folks. No. Oh. They don't like this stuff. It's Holy Ghost stuff. And they're arrested by the Sadducees. You see, they're sad, you see. <laughs> The power of God in operation because it takes the it takes the focus off of them. And we got a lot of people today that's standing behind a pulpit trying to draw attention to themselves. They don't want the power of God to happen. They want people to notice them. There's a lot of people saying the power of God, oh, it passed away with the apostles. We don't see miracles today. That was Old Testament. <laughs> and just in the early church. No, 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 no. Well, they're just sad, you see, when God gets the glory. In Acts chapter 4, verse 9, Peter is brought before the same people that crucified Jesus. Ananias, Caiaphas, the both high priest, and then the others gathered around, you know, the same crew that was 
heaping insults on Jesus as he was hanging on the cross. Come down from there if you're the son of God. The same ones that had Jesus arrested, the same ones that had Jesus that yelled crucify out there and stirred the mob. And now they've pulled in Peter and John because they don't like that they're doing the same kind of things, going about doing good, acting like Jesus. <laughs> God forbid that Christians should act like the Christ. And Peter, who had ran away, if you remember, when the soldiers came to get him the first time, when, G when they were with Jesus, now that he's filled with the Holy Ghost and fire, tells these same people that he was so scared of, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know why he was healed, how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you, and to all the people of Israel, that he was healed by the power of the name of Jesus Christ. The Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. He ain't scared now, is he? You know, you, you can't scare a dead man. How are you going to scare a dead man? Boo! See, we died to ourselves. I die daily, Paul says. So I don't get up in the flesh and get scared and fear what man says. Fear what man can do to me. Fear God who can throw your butt in hell. Did I say that out loud? See, the Bible says that some people love the praises of men more than they love the praises of God. I don't mean to go there, but the fear of man brings a snare, the Bible says. It's holding you back. A snare is keeping you captive. Many of us are not being like Christ because we're afraid of what somebody might think or say or do. And here, Peter, he's got, see, the, the difference in Peter now and then is he's gotten filled with the Holy Ghost now and boldness. So he's, pre he's not just preaching, he's preaching the word with boldness. The, the, the Jesus whom you crucified. And so many of us have our faith in ourselves. We won't tell somebody about Jesus. I saw a man the other day. I didn't really know him. He said, oh, my back, my back. I hurt my back yesterday. I don't know if he's a Christian or not. I said, can I pray for you? All right. I went over there, laid hands on him, prayed in the name of Jesus that he would be healed. Didn't see him for a couple of days, about a week later. I said, how's your back? Oh, man, it, it's good. He didn't even remember that it had got healed. He said, you know, that next day I didn't feel it no more. In the old days, I would have been afraid to pray for somebody because I was afraid I didn't have the faith to get them healed. That I don't have power. Let me just tell you something. It's not about you. That's the problem. It's, it's not about us. We can, we, you know, we plant and we water, but God brings the increase. If I pray for somebody and they don't get healed, it ain't on me. I'm just the messenger. And, and when I'm behind this pulpit, that's all I am. It's just the messenger. And we are to be able to pray for people without worrying about what if it don't happen, they're going to think I didn't have the faith or whatever. You're having faith in your faith and not in God. We got to stop having faith in our faith. When I, when I finally threw up my hands and said, well, it ain't about me at all, is it, God? He's right. Yeah, you got that right. <laughs> so I just, I just do what God says do now, and I leave the results to him. Amen. So if you pray for somebody that don't get healed, don't take it as an insult or don't, as a failure. That's not on you. They're healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ. He says, for the Jesus, 
For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which a man may be saved. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training. Is there any ordinary people in here today? Any ordinary people with no special training? We're in a church with a pastor with no special training. We're all ordinary men and women. You don't have to have PhD in front of your name to pray for somebody. You just have, need to have the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them to be men who had been with Jesus. And therein lies the key. You remember that scripture from the love chapter? You hang out with love. And you're going to have the boldness. Such as I have, give I thee. The religious people are always backed into a corner by the power of God. They have no answer for it. So what did they do? They conferred with one another. What should we do with these men? Obviously, they've done a major miracle here, and all the people are on their side. What do we do so that we can save face? And so they said, well, we'll, we'll just tell them not to do it no more. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, okay, and they came back out and says, don't preach in Jesus' name no more. And in verse 19, Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. It's time we start obeying God rather than men. That is when Peter and John went back and they told the rest of the people in the upper room, look, we prayed for this guy and he jumped up. <laughs> and he started leaping around and all the people came and we prayed and guess what? Tomorrow we're going to have 2,000 more people in our church. And they're like, oh, no, what are we going to do? And then, then, the, then the prayer that we started with in chapter 4, after one, two, and three, then the building shook. Acts chapter one, accept the call for which you were created, your commission with Jesus. Acts chapter two, have your day of Pentecost. Get baptized in the Holy Ghost, stay filled in the Holy Ghost, and hook up with the family of God. Acts chapter three, Overcome your fear. Act in faith. Use the gifts that you were given and speak the word of God boldly. And remember all the things we talked about. It ain't about you. It ain't, it ain't your faith that's doing it. In Acts chapter 4, expect a whole lot of shaking to be going on. And, and that's why we're driving this so hard. That's why I've been on this series for three weeks, driving this hard. We've got to get outside of our comfort zone. You will never live the life God called you to in your, in your barca lounger. It just ain't going to happen. You're going to have to get outside of your comfort zone, get outside of your fear of man, and you're going to have to step into who God called you to be. You're going to have to move forward. You're going to have to grow up from where you are now so that you can do more than you've ever done. So there we were, and we pulled the boat out. I was biting my fingernails, so I was going to kill me. I was contemplating not even going back home. Just Maybe I could drive to Arkansas and find a little place or something, you know. And Heath's over there, let me drive, let me drive, let me drive. I thought to myself, he's 13, we're pulling a boat. But he will be getting his license in a couple of years, and he needs to know how to pull a boat. All right, but you be careful. So I threw him the keys. 
and we took off driving home. Now, I don't know what, the, what was happening, but something was going wrong with the truck. It just didn't, didn't have any get up and go. I, didn't, I was kept asking, you pushing the pedal right, you know? And it was just driving slow and sluggish, and it didn't take long for smoke to become, come boiling out of the front of the hood there. And Heath had the good enough sense to pull over, you know, and I thought he did good, and we waited till we could see again, then we pulled back off. And then it would boil over again. We'd have to pull off, and this got to be a routine. But we decided, you know, that if we would just drive faster between boil overs, we could get home quicker. <laughs> Later, Papa was to describe in some detail how to take the emergency brake off. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> we're on the last stretch. And almost to Papa's house, and we're on a two-lane gravel road. And here comes this just cloud of dust coming at us at record speed. And I, I elbowed Heath and said, don't never drive like that, idiot. And it went zooming past us. And Heath did a double take, and he looked at me, and he said, that looked like a Datsun B210 pulling a John boat. <laughs> and I said, yeah, a putrid green one just like mine. Papa had welded a... A trailer hitch on the back of my bumper. <laughs> and he was testing it out to see if that 100-pound towing capacity of my Datsun four-cylinder B210 would tow a boat. I guess it did. <laughs> but I say all that to say it's time that each of us grow up to our next step in Christ. It's time to take the mercy break off Time to stop turning the choke switch instead of the ignition switch and let Papa weld a trailer hitch on your little Datsun B210 so that you, be, you can become a fisher of men and you can haul a boat full of people on the way to heaven.